Welcome to God's Planning, Contemplative Preachers, Contemporary Age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. Hello, friends, and welcome back to God's Planning. Uh, you are joined today by, uh, well, me, the head <laughs> God's Planner for this episode, Father Patrick Briscoe. And I am accompanied today by another God's planer, Father Jacob Bertrand Jansik. Hello, Father. Hi. I don't know if I'm a God's planer. I don't know if I like that, but God's God's planers. It's the noun of God's planning. I understand God's the planning. grammar, but it's a gerund, so it's also <laughs> technically a noun. But yes, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> we'll we'll just move on from gerunds and talk about something other than grammar. <laughs> That's maybe a little bit more within our wheelhouse. Um, today's episode, I, you know, we, we want to get at something, a kind of cultural phenomenon. Um, now, being from New England, yourself, Father Jacob Bertrand, you enjoy the crisp delights of fall. Uh, what was what was your sense of what was your sense of Halloween as a kid? Uh, how big of a holiday was it for you all growing up? Mm, I think it was just as big as anywhere anywhere else. I mean, we got dressed up and trick or treated. Usually, we went to my grandfather's my mother's father's yeah neighborhood um where the house where my mom grew up because they lived it wasn't a cul-de-sac but it was like a very big like kind of circle loop type thing you know so you drove down the street and then there was a big circle and it was like super not that like i was gonna say safe as far as like traffic there was like no traffic in the neighborhood and like every house was like decorated and it, a lot of people went trick-or-treating there so it was a big like, you know, everybody was giving out candy. You could go to every house in the circle. You came back with a ton of candy. So it was just like, that's, you know, kids running across back and forth across the street, at least how I remember it. So uh, that's where we did a lot of our trick or treating um, growing up through Halloween. But we always said, I'm, I'm, I might've mentioned I have siblings on the podcast. I'm the oldest of three. So, and we're all pretty close in age. So we always had costumes and all that sort of stuff, but that was kind of Halloween. Mostly cared about the candy and that's really it. But yeah, we did the same. I mean, I was just gonna say, I kind I'm of the, got over Halloween quickly, like after, you know, like high school and stuff was like, whatever. But as a kid, it was a lot of fun. I'm the son of a dentist. So dad was, you know, filled with all of his candy tooth decay jokes uh, around Halloween time. And uh, I, I'm luckily, you know, luckily, he never did anything crazy, right? Cause some dentists like pass out toothbrushes, or like give mm -hmm. out toothpaste. Um, they do things like that, which I think would have made our house a target. Uh, so, oh yeah, you're gonna so get luckily, teepeed in a second. <laughs> exactly. Luckily, my parents didn't do anything like that, and we and we survived Halloween. But some places in the U.S., I mean, Halloween is like the holiday, right? Like Long Island, noted, you know, notably, I think Halloween is a really big deal there. Um. So, I, but because of the time of year, because of the holiday, because of Halloween, I think um, the, the this this theme of the occult, which is the theme of today's episode, you know, comes really to the forefront of people's minds. Um, you know, you see all, all the kinds of decorations, uh, all, uh, you know, Halloween parties, the idea of people dressing up, um, doing doing all different kinds of things. And, you know, it, it can be, this is the time of year where, where all of this kind of comes out. Uh, we see it in Halloween movies, we see it in, um, in some of our practices around the holidays. So uh, it, it's, on, it's on our minds. And the reason we wanted to do this episode, this topic, is because um, the Catholics have serious beliefs that are that are at stake here. Um, there's a kind of uh, uh, there's a kind of wrapping up of our Catholic culture of a kind of pop culture, and then more seriously, um, some insidious aspects of evil, some some spiritual things uh, that that are real and that that really you know need to command our attention. So I I, I just want to begin our conversation you know by talking to you, Father Jake Bertrand. If I say, what's the occult? What constitutes the occult? How do you define the difference between something that's grave and a seriously uh, concerning spiritual practice as opposed to something that's, you know, more or less harmless, like getting dressed up and trick-or-treating on Halloween? So to talk about, I guess, what constitutes um, the occult, uh, it's it's helpful, I think, to sort of appeal to kind of the moral, um, the moral, the way that that morality and virtue and vice are talked about. So if you look at any sort of helpful or good or solid kind of moral treatise, 
Um, and we're talking about morality here, at least by way of introduction, because the occult is something bad or, you know, that the church rightfully teaches as evil. So we're talking about good and bad, evil and uh, good, I guess. Um, but if you look at any at the way by which the moral life is is discussed by St. Thomas, for example, he always talks about what is good or the virtuous um, and uh, what is vicious or it's opposed vices. So we often understand what is good and right and just and um, those sort of things uh, in in conjunction with, with what is opposed to it. So, you know, pride as opposed to humility. So we understand the virtue of humility as compared to the vice of pride. Um, same thing here for like, at least defining or understanding the occult. Um, so the occult being an offense against the first commandment. Uh, for those who have forgotten the first commandment, um, I am the <laughs> Lord, your God, you shall have no other gods before me. Um, so offenses of of the occult are categorized as um, or f uh, as offenses, or you know the occult are ca is categorized as offenses against the first commandment. So worshiping, in some perverse way or some uh, vicious way, um, things that are that are not God. Um, so generally, we can lump things under two types of vice. Remember again, thinking about the virtuous life, the the good is always the mean. It's always the middle, and it's always avoiding either a defect, which where there's not enough of something going on, or an excess where there's too much of something going on. So think of temperance and with with food, um, we want to eat properly and and find that right mean, that right middle. We don't want to eat such that we're you know not enough, so that we're starving ourselves, and we don't want to eat and be a glutton to ex excess. So same thing here. So with the occult, we have uh, an excess and a not an excess or a lack. So on the excess side, we have what's called superstition, right? We've all heard of that superstition where it's a it's an excess of religion where we see religion or like kind of religious like things in everything that we that's around us or irreligion, superstition or irreligion where irreligion is where there's you see nothing of the divine in the world or God's um, God's vestige or imprint or or hand and kind of thing so yeah that's i think an easy enough way to and if we hold to that sort of teaching that that the occult is opposed to the first commandment then we can begin to talk more about like what it is what the occult is um those kind of things and and, and also like father patrick was saying get a sense of like why like dressing up for halloween is probably not falling into the occult and going out trick-or-treating for candy you know it, is does that constitute an offense against the first commandment not necessarily you know i don't think so so at least setting setting that up. Yeah, that's right. So these so these offenses against the fir first commandment then can be broken up into different um, different species, right? Different particular offenses. And so the major one, of course, is idolatry, right? You know, the first commandment is to, uh, to not have any other gods before the Lord our God, which is a good way to kind of check, right, and say like, well, is this superstitious? Uh, well, the the, the follow up question then is to say, well, how does this actually orient my practice towards God, right? So Mm -hmm. I think one thing, um, one practice that that uh, I would say would be would be superstitious, right? Is the the Saint Joseph sell your house kit, you know, where you simply take the statue of the saint and bury it in the backyard, and hope that hope that because you've faced the statue towards like the northwest um, and buried it in your backyard, that your that your house will sell for the price that your family needs. That's superstition, uh, as opposed to putting the statue in your home and praying to St. Joseph for his intercession, asking that he would go to the Lord God uh, to, to provide for you. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so I think this question of, is it idolatrous or not? Is this practice leading me to or away from God? In the case of the statue is leading, you know, where you're burying the statue in the backyard, it's leading you away from God because you're trying to seize something, you know, to your own power and to, to kind of arrange it, to make it happen. You're trying to, to do something uh, apart from the way that God has planned it. Um, another one is divination, which has to do with knowledge. Father Jake Bertrand, why don't you say a little bit about that as a species of, uh, yeah. of this offense? Yeah, when we're talking about the occult or when like you think about the occult, I think the next two things, that divination and magic are, are kind of where, at least in the popular mind, where the occult really kind of gets its like, you know, I don't know, heft. I don't know if that's like the right word to use, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it came totally. to mind. But yeah. um, so with divination is, is you know, having... Uh, sort of recourse to Satan or demons or conjuring the dead or other practices um, to like unveil the future, to gain some sort of knowledge, to divine about the future is how the words used. you know, so like this includes horoscopes, astrology, palm readings, um, interpretations of like omens, casting lots, um, mediums, uh, all of those kind of things uh, 
to to sort of get some sort of um, knowledge of the future. Um, they contradict the reason it's it's wrong is because it contradicts it, it, it's an offense against God and who God is, and that God is um, uh, God is the one to whom we owe this sort of respect and this position in creation and and summoning demons or spirits so as to gain an upper hand on on divine providence seems to be problematic. Um, I don't know if you have more to say about that, but at least a little definition there. Yeah, I think the most common form of divination that's actually really serious is the Ouija board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you think like, oh, this is a harmless childhood toy. Uh, but 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 if you let your kids play with this stuff or or if if you your, you yourself have um, confess it, get rid of that sin, because that that's an opening um, for for evil things, for evil spirits. Um, that's an opening for evil to come into you because there you're trying to there you're trying to call upon a spirit and you're trying to have access to a to a reserved knowledge to knowledge that's not for you. This is different than prophecy or any of the any of the spiritual gifts that the Lord gives, because prophecy is an expression of God's will as God wants to use it. God uses the prophets uh, uh, because of a particular vocation that they've been called to. Um, and and they, they have this blessing of God to make manifest his will. It's very different than trying to use, again, a, another means going away from God so as to determine or decipher uh, or, or to know his will. I also think that some of this is... Um, some of this is so dangerous because it contravenes the instruction of Jesus about signs. Um, you know, a, a lot of times people, people want their faith to be confirmed by signs. And that's not necessarily the way that the Lord will work. Sometimes God will confirm things for us by signs, uh, but, but God will do it. We, we, can't go, we can't go looking for signs and demanding signs in the ways that we want it. Again, the primacy of action is on God, not on us. And so to, to go the, the route of the occult to, to kind of demand a sign, you know, to know, for example, to, to, to demand uh, from a Ouija board whether or not grandma's in heaven um, is a kind of demand for a sign unfitting uh, with Jesus' own teaching about the nature of signs and faith. Okay, but we can move. Let's move on. You mentioned magic. Let's move on to magic. What do you have to say about that? Yeah. Magic, I think, like I was saying, pairs with divination when, our, when we think of the occult generally, I think. Um, Magic here, we're not talking about like magic of like card tricks or like sleight of hand tricks or the, you know, these kind of things. Magic, we're talking about like magic or sorcery by which we try to, um, you know, use use magic or sorcery to uh, for our own services to have like supernatural power over others, over the elements, over time uh, for the sake of uh, for the sake of ourselves, you know, it's, it's not like a parlor trick, but a, a use of spells, incantations, other things to of the occult to 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 control others, to, to control other things. These practices, um, you know, are are always to be condemned because we don't to manipulate like the world or particularly others um, violates one like one's humanity one's freedom it also violates you know the the imago dei in that person and god's control over the cosmos um so this is um where perhaps like with halloween we think of like casting spells and like hocus pocus and those kind of things um which in itself hocus pocus even those words is a is a um uh, a sort of what bastard bastardization of um hoc est enum corpus meum which are the words of institution of the mass so like even just saying the word hocus pocus um you know i'm explaining but like using that as like a joke it's like well actually that's like it's kind of a blasphemous term that's kind of been popularized so you see even there how like evil things kind of creep in but um these two things divination magic kind of controlling others by either knowing or having foresight or by controlling them in in say it specifically are are problematic for the reason that pa father patrick already laid out that i laid out um but i think really get at the heart of the occult when we talk about them good with that let's um just take a short break um we can continue our conversation you know when we come back we want to say a little bit about uh, angels and devils about these kind of spiritual powers that, that we're at war with, and then so, some other things to look out for, uh, some recommended spiritual practices in, li in living a spiritual life that is attuned to these things, but one that doesn't allow them to, to get out of control. Um, so let's take a short break and we'll be back with you in a second. You are listening to God's Planning. 
Visit us at godsplaining.org to listen to our episodes, shop our store, and donate to our podcast. All gifts go to improving the podcast and bringing the gospel to more listeners. Thanks for your support. Hello, friends. Welcome back to God's Planning. We have two God's Planers. I just, I have to use the word again, Father Jacob Bertrand. You know, you haven't condemned it so thoroughly means that, you know, I now have to cling to it. Um, until, Fair enough. You know, your until the last day. Yep, that's right. So, mm-hmm. Uh, so, so here we are, two Godswainers. We are Godswaining the occult, um, and uh, one of the things that that I think that I think we've alluded to at the top part of the episode, right? Um, but but now we, now is worth um, some flushing out is just about the real uh, the real influence of the powers of evil, the real the real the real influence of of dark angels uh, of darkness, um, the servants of darkness. Uh, so so who are these? We use these words, devils and demons. What what do we mean? by these words um, from a Catholic, from a Christian perspective. Yeah. Um, So simply put, demons are fallen angels. Um, They are angels who have sinned um, and who have fallen uh, out of a state, out of being in a state of grace, out of the beatific vision, out of being with our Lord and are, you know, punished for that. So um, when we look at like the hierarchy of creation, we can see, you know, we can make an explanation as to um, sort of the, the lower forms here on earth, um, you know, moving up the plants, mineral or, you know, minerals, rocks, and then you have plants, animals, humans, which are humans as human beings. We are um, in sold bodies. Uh, and then you have the angelic realities that are um, also sold. You know, they have an intellect and a will, but they don't have bodies. And then, um, you know, outside of creation, of course, is God. God is not part of the hierarchy of creation. Um, but at the moment when, when angels were created, um, they had free will to choose to be with God or not to be with God. And because given the way by which they know this, perhaps like getting into this might be a, a topic for another episode, but, um, in choosing against God for whatever reason, there are different theological theories as to why the angels chose some of the angels, Lucifer, um, being the, the lead angel on this, on this choosing against God, um, they chose against and were punished, were damned for that, were cast from heaven. So. The angels, um, the the fallen angels, the demons, the de- the devil and and his demons. Uh, I guess their their existence now is is really um, to seek to draw others away from God, to draw others into their deprivation and and into their misery, um, just out of spite. Really, um, one of the points here that I that I want to make uh, hard and and early on is that by saying that the devil is a fallen angel, right away we're saying the devil is a creature. Um, and this is, this is very, very important, right? Because it means that his powers are limited. Um, so one of the things that, that happens, um, is we exaggerate what he and his servants are actually able to do. Um, and this has to be named, right? Because it gives a Catholic a kind of confidence about the spiritual life and it tunes us to the reality of things as they actually are. The devil is a creature. He has, he has limited power. Some of them are, 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 are intense because they're angelic powers, but they're limited. So the devil is not some other kind of cosmic force equal to the power of good that's that's able to do whatever he wants. No, he's constrained. He's limited. He's restricted because of his creatureliness. Um, so, so I think that's a, a kind of consequence of that first proposition that you were saying that, that really helps us to flush out and to say very clearly um, and to assert in a kind of dynamic way, right? Like we're not all of a sudden at the, at the um, uh, subjected to the whims of, another kind of evil God. That's, that's not what's going on here. There's only the Lord God and everything that God has made. <laughs> and uh, the, the devil or evil is one of the things that God has made and has been corrupted. Um, right. So what, what sort of powers, you know, then, you know, so, so let's flush this out a little bit more. What sort of powers do, do devils or, or demons possess Father Jacob Bertrand? Yeah, that that's, that's a good point to make that because I that that you were just making right because often we think that like you have the good God and the bad God you have God and the devil and they're kind of warring and it's true that the devil is warring against God but they're not you have God and creature same you know same thing so as I said before as I said before there the, the devil and his demons are trying to uh, lure people away from God uh and really out of envy and pride. Um, St. Thomas talks about envy and pride being the motivation of the demons work and assault on us. Um, but they, a couple things I think, yeah, just worth pointing out is that uh, the devil doesn't cause us to sin, uh, in the sense that he doesn't have the power to make us do evil. Uh, he can instigate it. 
he can encourage it, but he doesn't have the power to corrupt our will or to like remove our free will, um, which is incredibly important to remember. And, and as Father Patrick was saying, you know, a very powerful reality in our in our war and, and in our battle against Satan is that Satan doesn't have the power to to make us not human and to and to and to mm. completely violate our will. Now, he can instigate, he can tempt, he can do all of these things. Sure. Um, but we remain humans. We remain free and always free to to choose to choose our, our to choose our Lord um, in, in moments of temptation. Uh, the other thing is the the devil tempts us outwardly and and can incline incline us towards something like I've already said. But he can't move the will in the way God does with His grace. You know, the grace can can move our will, remain you know keeping our freedom, but can move our will towards God. Can incline us towards the good. And the devil can kind of hold out carrots in front of us that we might be tempted to chase. And they can be very strong and powerful, but in the end, he can't vitiate our freedom. Um, so I think those are a couple of things just worth mentioning that he, you know, Satan doesn't have control over us or control over creation in the way that God does because he's a creature and, and not, you know, another type of God. I think um, one thing that's important too is people often say like, well, you know, I, I just, I had this thought and I don't know where it came from. Um, you know, like they, they'll be, for example, in, in the middle of even a prayer or something. And, and this, this, this just like horrible lewd thought will occur to them. Um, is it fair to say father, that this is the work of, of the devil or of other demons? Can, can they do this sort of thing? Can they, can they, um, leave these temptations, um, with us? Yeah. Yes. And no. Um, yes. Yeah, so temptations can be the work of the devil. Sure. Um, whether we choose to interact with them or not, you know, this is, this is something too, that comes up, you know, in hearing confessions and I'm sure father you've experienced this, especially when people th talk about or confess impure thoughts, you know, I'm not sure if this was a sin or just a temptation. People are usually quick to recognize that temptations are not sin, but then it's a question of like, well, did this go beyond temptation? And, and my advice there is always like, well, did you entertain it? Did you like play with that thought in your mind? So the devil can, can, can hold out things for us to be tempted by. Sure, of course. Um, but he doesn't force us to sin. You know, he doesn't force us to capture that and to hold on to it and to sort of dwell with it and those sort of things. So there, I, there is a distinction there. And I think that's an important one um, to just to make that, uh, you know, we're not forced uh, into into that in, in ourselves. Now we can build up habits where, you know, if, if we have the habit of, of entertaining like impure thoughts in our mind as they come up, well, of course we might be more given to entertain impure habits or impure thoughts because it's a habit of our mind um, and that we've built up. But all the same, it's not the devil that forces us to, to do that. There's this great, if a, a great book to read on this is uh, the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis, which mm, is basically yep. um, these letters between a senior devil and his nephew who he's training to be a devil. And at one point he says that, you know, if I believe it's he uses the example of playing cards, he tell, and, and this lower devil is being has been assigned a person to like lure away from God. And the devil, uh, this lower ranked devil in training asks his uncle, well, what should I do to tempt this, this guy further along? And he says, don't do anything at this point. He said, if, if cards is enough to like damn him to hell, let him play cards, you know, not because playing cards in itself is an evil thing. But if you have this sort of idolatry, if you have this, these offenses against the, against the first commandment, such that you're, you're no longer, that the Lord is not your focus, that you're not pursuing the Lord, but distracted by these little things will let the distraction continue um, because it'll spiral towards, you know, greater and greater evils as we move farther and farther away from God, which I think is a really helpful way of understanding the way the devil works. Yeah, sometimes there are like these kind of great possessions and these kind of things. But the way Satan kind of gets us most often is not by, um, you know, these huge kind of anti like miraculous. I don't want to say miraculous in the good way moments, but by these kind of subtle temptations and allowing us to build up habits that are contrary to, to goodness and virtue and God and us to come kind of, you know, lukewarm. This is why our Lord condemns lukewarmness, because it's sort of the unseen killer by uh, of the spiritual life and of our yeah life that's of right grace. and i just want to say as we kind of wrap up this section and move on to it to, to what we what we do about this stuff in our own spiritual lives um i want to say that it, it only god knows the interior thoughts of man only god knows mm -hmm. our hearts and the devil is forced to use temptation to kind of 
to try us, right? The, de the devil and, and other, other little demons, they only know what they can observe outwardly. They only know what they see. Um, and they, they, they make inferences based on, based on what they, what they can deduce, but they can't, they can't read your mind. They can't, not unless you've given them the power to, which I recommend not doing, uh, for, for obvious reasons. But, uh, but this is why, for example, in the scriptures, um, Christ is tempted. This is one, this is one of the thoughts on, uh, you know, to explain this great mystery of Christ's life is because the devil's not sure. He thinks he knows who Jesus is, but he's not sure. And so he's tempting him so as to see, to find out, to confirm Christ's identity, right? Because again, uh, the devil and demons cannot read our minds. They cannot know our interior. Only God knows that. And they can only know what they observe outwardly by the kind of drawing out uh, through supplying various temptations. So I just wanted to offer that. Um, so, okay. So how, how do we, how do we as Catholics build up a, a kind of spiritual life that responds to the occult? in a way that's reasoned and reasonable, um, a way that's not superstitious, uh, a way that's meaningful on this front uh, of kind of spiritual warfare. Father Jacob Bertrand, what are your, what are your top tips here? Yeah. So first I think, um, you know, as we talked about, the devil has limited powers, but he also has powers, you know? And so we have to be careful not to give him control over parts of our lives, especially in stupid ways or like silly ways or unreflective ways, you know? So like, mm -hmm. um, thinking that like a Ouija board is harmless is like, well, it's not because it, it basically opens a door, um, to the, like the spirit world, which we really shouldn't be delving into and trying to control those kind of, you know, it just opens, it, it's an open invitation for, for, you know, uh, for demonic realities to enter in. That's just like as plainly put as possible. Um, the, the sort of like thinking, you know, what we consume is also an important reality, whether that's reading or movies, you know, like having just a repertoire of like possession movies is probably not like, uh, how does that benefit? You know, how is that helpful? Those kind of things. I think too, perhaps again, another a topic for another episode, like things that are guised as like just good for you, but, you know, have sort of spiritual issues and implications things like yoga um now you might think okay they're just being super nitpicky but like yoga has it's rooted and founded on sort of eastern spiritual practices that are contrary to christian to like the truth and christian spirituality in our lord so it's like yeah there there are even if we just do it for exercise well we have to quite like why you know what is what is that root here so um just being careful not scrupulous but just prudent about the things that we're doing and then as far as other things, um, I think, you know, ignoring the devil is a good thing. Um, you know, we don't want to slip into like a, a superstition here that the devil has a hand in every, you know, oh, the, the lights turned off. It must be the devil, you know, like, oh, there was a creaking in the house. It must be some demon or a ghost. Like, well, I mean, if we're constantly thinking about the devil, we're, we're giving him time, you know, and we're not thinking about the Lord. So mm -hmm. building up regular practice of prayer and re relying on the angels, St. Michael in particular, the St. Michael prayer, you know, our guardian angels, um, praying to them and those sort of things are, are super important and helpful. And, um, yeah, it, remember that like the occult is an offense against the first commandment. Sins of the occult are offenses against the first commandment. And the first sins again, the first commandment commands us, uh, to, to, to love God and love God alone. And when we build idols out of other things, we're, we're distracted from God and him in our life. So I think in my mind, that's, that's the most important, important tip or thing or practice. Yeah, that's right. I just want to echo that. I went to confession this spring to a priest um, during a, a kind of afternoon of recollection. And uh, I, it mentioned a couple of things I was dealing with. And the priest said, well, do you say the St. Michael prayer? And I said, yeah, I usually say it once a day. And uh, he laughed at me and he said, only once a day. <laughs> so, so uh, his, his emphasis was, you know, if there's something that his point was that if there's something you're worried about, you know, it, uh, address it, say the St. Michael prayer, um, you know, make as Father Jacob Bertrand is talking about a, a really serious habit of prayer in your life. And when you talk to exorcists, um, sh should you consult these priests, they will always assure you that the, that the best cures are a fidelity to the sacraments, faithfulness to confession in particular, and the reception of Holy Communion. These are powerful, powerful, powerful aids in the spiritual life um, that, that, that help us um, engage this sort of combat. Well, thanks for joining us. That's all we have time for today on this episode of The Occult. We hope that you uh, have a, a, a pleasant Halloween. You know, maybe you're out trick-or-treating with some kids, but um, we, we beg you not to 
uh, go see a fortune teller or to use a Ouija board because that will just make a spiritual mess that either, you know, us or some other priest is going to have to clean up. So don't do it, please. <laughs> Uh, please know of our prayers for you. We'd like to thank all of you who support us on Patreon. Um, you're gradually helping to, you are helping us in a significant way. You're not gradually helping. You're helping us in a significant way to gradually improve. We're the ones who are gradually improving the quality of our show. So thank you for supporting us and supporting this project. Um, know always of our prayers for you. God bless. Thanks for listening to God's Planning, a work of the Dominican Friars of the province of St. Joseph. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Leave a review on your podcast app and visit us at godsplaining.org.